Morning, Chris Hole, Wake Forest Baptist Health, Infectious Diseases. Um, boy, it feels great to be back. We had a couple of weeks off, one, uh, one because of a schedule conflict that came up at the last minute. And last week, it's hard to believe now, but we had an ice storm, remember? And uh, um, no one could get in. So um, a lot has happened in, those la in the last two weeks, um, a few milestones, and some that we'll go over a few, few of the things um, today. Uh, first thing to start off on a somber note um, is that we hit 500,000 deaths. That's half a million people in the United States. Um, and it's one of those things which is a number that's so high that I think it's kind of hard for people to kind of wrap their minds around it. But, um, but that's, uh, that's, that's a, a staggering toll uh, for, uh, for a year's worth of pandemic. Um, you could put it in perspective. There have been worse pandemics and plagues in the past history of the world, but, uh, but this one registers as a significant pandemic event um, that's affected um, societies everywhere. So that's, that's about the only somber news I have today because the rest of it is pretty good news. And um, to tell you the truth, I'm feeling more optimistic this latter part of February than I felt through since the beginning of this, because <clears throat> there's a lot of good things that are happening. First of all, if you look at our at our case rates across the country, um, pretty pretty staggering decline since the second week of January, uh, second or third week, and um, particularly in some places like the Midwest where they had a really high place to come down to a low place. Um, but here in North Carolina, since we didn't start off so high. We, you know, our, our slope down isn't quite quite as steep, but um, the case numbers now in our area in North Carolina run between 20 and uh, 40 per 100,000, and that's the lowest it's been since uh, the first part of October. And if you remember before Halloween last year, we were all feeling pretty good, um, and um, while the cases were occurring, um, we, it was nowhere near what we had in January. Um, <clears throat> so here, here in Forsyth County, we're at 26 per 100,000, and our, um, our uh, percent positive on our test now is knocking on the door of 5%, so maybe by, this, by Monday or next week we'll be below 5%. Um, and some other good things have happened. Um, our schools are open and doing well, um, and uh, this week. Our teachers are getting vaccinated, which is really, a, really a cool thing because it's we're moving into another group now for vaccine. Um, phase three is opened, um, and once the K through 12 teachers we get a good handle on that, we'll be moving into um, um, other level teachers, such as universities and colleges, other frontline workers, grocery stores, firemen, people who've been slogging it out, reporters. <laughs> throughout the whole pandemic, everyone will be. So the, the thing is right now, um, while vaccine supply is going to get better soon, um, uh, the, there's still going to be a lot more people who will be eligible for vaccine rather th uh, than who will have uh, a vaccine available. So it kind of means what you're getting if you're in the next group coming up, you're getting what's like a hunting license basically. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to bag a deer, um, and so um, people are, um, are are trying to figure out how how to get access. I, you know, as we get through it through March, um, our vaccine situation is going to really improve. <clears throat> and as we've been saying before, the the supply that we get in the state that gets distributed out to the counties and individual health systems has clearly been the, the limiting factor on, on vaccines. And, um, and while initially it, it was the getting the shot givers and the places to give it and getting all the logistics together, it, for the last three, four weeks, it's been um, vaccine supply. Um, that's gonna improve. Um, the two messenger RNA vaccines, um, Pfizer and Moderna's, um, are, gonna, are ramping up production. They've got their manufacturing processes down. They've got some new sites where they're making vaccine. 
um, they'll probably be able to increase their production by 10 times over the next month or more. Um, and then um, this week, um, we'll get the final EUA approval. Um, the FDA's committee voted yesterday to approve Johnson & Johnson, Janssen's uh, new vaccine. We're going to talk about that in a second. And, um, and that, um, while the number of doses available initially will be somewhat limited, um, by the end of March, they'll be um, much more formidable. And, um, and that's going to help us a lot. The more players on the block that have vaccine and can give us vaccine, obviously, the faster and more people we can vaccinate. Even though vaccine supply has been limited, we've, we've been working hard here in Forsyth County. Um, so, so roughly right at now, the number's right around 63, I think between 63 and 65,000 people in Forsyth County has been vaccinated. So if you do, do the math, our population's about 360,000. That's pretty darn good. Um, that means that for every five people, one people have been vaccinated. Um, it's been the priority groups of healthcare providers, but predominant um, group now that's been vaccinated as far as percentages um, are our over 65. And that um, has, um, translates into roughly 30 to 35% of our um, over 65 group now uh, have gotten vaccinated. That's uh, starting to show up a little bit in our rates of hospitalization um, here in the region. Um, and because our numbers of COVID patients in the hospital, including ICU patients, is the lowest it's been since last September. Um, and so a lot of pressure off of healthcare. And, um, um, and that's, uh, that's a fantastic thing. Um, so if you haven't got the hint yet, this is all good news, <laughs> and it's all. This is all. Um, this is all really got me thrilled, actually. Um, just to summarize a little bit about the vaccines that are out now, um, so we'll combine it with the messenger RNA vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer's, and then Johnson and Johnson's vaccine. Johnson and Johnson's is a little bit different vaccine than the other two. It uses. Um, um, a DNA conscript inside of a, a vector, and the vector is actually uh, an adenovirus, another virus that can't replicate. So it can't cause disease or infection, but it's a little package vehicle for DNA. DNA compared to RNA is a lot more stable. So it means you don't have to have these really ultra cold freezers form, uh, and you can put them in normal refrigerator temperatures for two months. And, uh, and the, the, vax, the EUA that's going to that's gonna get approved by the FDA um, is going to say you can do it with one dose, which makes the logistics a lot easier because you don't have to schedule the second dose of vaccine. Um, and, uh, and so that's going to be a, a nice addition. Um, so I'm waiting to see what the CDC's ACIP, which meets this weekend, says as far as um, are there certain groups that should get one vaccine over another. I got a feeling what they're going to say is that just get a vaccine and it doesn't matter so much which one. Um, and there's, um, there's some, something different about Johnson & Johnson's vaccine is that the, the local side effects of pain and swelling in the arm or of fever and fatigue and muscle aches the day after like what you see with Moderna and Pfizer's is not, um, it's not a big of a deal. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't hurt quite as much and these expected reactions are, are milder um, with Johnson & Johnson's vaccine. So we'll have to see how they're gonna recommend it out. Um, I'm hearing a lot of questions about, can I choose my vaccine? Because I've heard that you know the messenger RNA vaccines have 95% efficacy, and the newspaper told me that um, Johnson and Johnson's is only 70%. So I want the higher efficacy vaccine. Well, you know, there's something about vaccine efficacy that I think people are missing, kind of the number and what the numbers really mean. Um, and um, what you want is a vaccine that that prevents death and severe infections, and all of the vaccines available to us now, including Johnson & Johnson's, does that. 
and um, and that that's a that's a big thing to remember. Um, the second thing is is you want a vaccine that slows transmission throughout the population, and um, and all of the vaccines out do that. And um, so um, if you're thinking about, well, I'm trying to get the better vaccine to protect me, you know, it probably doesn't really matter because they're, they're, they do what they're supposed to do. Um, and doing the numbers game is hard. Another thing about the numbers game is that <clears throat> when you do a clinical trial, how the clinical trial is designed is how the and who gets enrolled or how what generates the numbers. So for instance, Johnson and Johnson's vaccine also was uh, given to people in Brazil and South Africa, which are a lot of these variants, and it actually performed pretty well. In fact, well enough to help protect the population. And so um, so that might be something that brings the numbers down some. Um, and also um, who you enroll and what um, are going to have risk for more severe disease makes a difference between them. So what you're going to start hearing now from those of us in public health and infectious diseases are a little bit less of the, this is the percentage protection you're going to get. And you're going to hear that the vaccine is safe and effective. And effective is effective. So there's no reason to play the game. Um, and the reason why this is important for people to, to, to recognize is that you might get, um, uh, might be offered a vaccine from a vaccine provider and not really have a choice because that's all you have. Because, <laughs> you know, some days as uh, here at Wake Forest Baptist Health, we get Moderna. The next week we might get Pfizer. And coming up next week we might get Johnson & Johnson. And we're going to give what we have because we want it, the most important thing is to get people vaccinated as quickly as possible. So for you as an individual out there, I would not be playing the numbers game on this. And if you're offered a vaccine, take it, because uh, it's much more important to get it quickly than it is to get to wait for a particular vaccine that you think you want. Um, the other thing that we've learned in the last few days um, is that the, um, um, the timing of the second dose of the vaccine, we have a lot more latitude um, than what initially came out. So when initially, the, and what the EUA says, well, for Pfizer's vaccine, you get the second dose in 21 days. For Moderna's vaccine, you get it in uh, 28 days. And that's because that's the way the clinical trial was constructed, even though in the trial there were people who got it later so we've crunched the numbers on that, and we also have information from vaccines that we've, you know, the, how many millions of doses we've given in the United States now that it says that you have up to six weeks after getting your first dose of your vaccine to get the second one, and it doesn't change how it works at all. And in fact, there's a little bit of data that shows if you wait an extra week, you actually might get a little bit more bang for the buck on the vaccine small but so so um, and the reason why this is important is some vaccine providers particularly as more vaccines come out are, are having to, to streamline a little bit how the the follow-up appointments are done and um, and th so that we can get as many people in to make sure that the second dose is given so if you are given an appointment for a second dose, say for the Pfizer vaccine, and it's 27 days instead of 21, don't sweat it. It'll be fine, uh, and you'll be protected. Um, and the, that extra week isn't going to make a, a hill of beans a difference to anyone. So, um, so some things going on here um, that we're really working on for vaccination is to make sure our historically marginalized populations are vaccinated, people of color and of ethnicity, um, and people who don't have access to health care readily. And um, I'm not going to go through the long list, but there, there's roughly 15 to 20 things that our health care systems are doing together here in Forsyth County. First of all, we're partnering because it's more efficient for um, the two major health care systems, Wake Forest Baptist Health and Novant, to partner together and work together in concert for the Forsyth County Health Department. 
and we can get people vaccinated. A great example of that is a partnership we're doing to get our teachers vaccinated. And today, I think, is the first day for that. And this afternoon, our teachers will be starting to get vaccinated and will be over the next four weeks. Um, other partnerships include getting out and outreach to the communities, working with churches and faith-based organizations, going out and visiting homebound patients um, who can't get to a vaccine center and vaccinating them there, um, partnering with regional health departments other than just Forsyth County, um, and then um, <clears throat> making sure that the, that the vaccine centers, so that we have some vaccine centers that are in places that are geographically close to our marginalized population, such as the downtown health plaza, the county doing it at the fairgrounds, um, working um, uh, in the Watton area for here in, in Winston. So um, these are just some of examples of how we can reach out. Forsyth County, actually, we're doing pretty well to get to our historically marginalized populations compared to some other places. We have more to go. It could always be stronger. It could always be better. And, um, and we're going to continue to work with our partners in doing that. Um, I think what I'm going to do now is turn to um, the questions that we've had submitted from people, um, our loyal viewers, um, who um, who've submitted questions about since, since people are getting vaccinated, there's a big, the questions are coming out and around. What can I do um, now that I've been vaccinated? Um, and what does it mean? Um, and so where does all this come from? This is from all of our desires to be back to normal, right? Um, what we're doing now um, is, is a little bit painful <laughs> and um, in order to control transmission of COVID and keep ourselves safe. So, but we'd all like to be back to normal. How does the vaccine factor in doing that? And so one overarching thing you have to think about um, with, um, with how vaccine impacts um, um, the pandemic is that um, it, it's gonna be a slow gradual process. Um, because until a substantial population percentage um, has become immune, either through natural disease or vaccination, um, we won't have the, that point of herd immunity where transmission will be prevented. So there's two reasons to get vaccinated. One is to protect you as the individual and the people you live with. The other is to protect the community and to be part of the herd immunity to be a, a citizen of the herd, I guess uh, you can think of it. And until we get the, the herd proportion up around 70 to 80% vaccinated, there's still gonna be COVID around. And, um, and so we're still gonna have to do things that, um, that um, are um, designed to, to slow transmission. And that includes continuing to wear our masks and continuing to distance, continuing to avoid um, bubble fusions, and lastly, the hand hygiene. And so those things aren't gonna go away. <clears throat> and, and they won't go away for a while. I think that, that you know people kind of gotten a thought that, well, now I'm vaccinated so I can get back to normal. So the way COVID is gonna go away, every time someone's vaccinated, that person will come out of the pandemic side and can move over to the world of normal. And every time someone's vaccinated, we'll throw the no another person into the normal batch. That's not how it goes. It, it goes that as more and more people get vaccinated, we all start to slide closer over as a group to the normal world if that makes sense, okay? So um, that when you, the overall, when people ask questions, what can I do when I'm vaccinated? You have to keep that in mind. We're gonna be inching in our way over as an entire society and community, and it's not gonna be tossing people over one by one. So um, with that, um, you, there, there's four basic tenements that I use in deciding whether something is safe. 
First of all, one, no vaccine is ever 100% protective. And I can't really predict um, for you as an individual um, easily, even with doing antibody tests and such, how protected you really are. And so not everyone is completely protected. So there will be some people who still can get COVID even though they've been vaccinated. You may not die, which is good. You probably won't get hospitalized, and that's good. Very likely won't get severe disease or moderately severe disease, that's good too. But you could still maybe become mildly, uh, have a mild case with symptoms, or you might still carry the virus trans transiently in your respiratory tract um, without getting sick. Um, now, while that likelihood is less if you've been vaccinated, it doesn't go down to zero. Um, and uh, we have early data that shows it's much less, but it's never going to reach zero. It doesn't really with any vaccine preventable disease. So one, not everyone's protected. Two is that people will transiently carry it and can still maybe give it to somebody else. Risk is lower, but it, it's still possible. Um, three is that um, there's sort of a community um, equity that I think somebody should, people should be thinking about. And the example I use for this is what equity means is when, when not everyone has access to vaccine or has been able to get an appointment for a vaccine, even then it means that we have a, a group of haves and we have a group of have-nots. And when you have haves and have-nots in a world of, of, of infection, um, it can create a lot of um, bad feelings and discord and, um, and it's just not good for society. So here's the example. Um, let's say you're in a neighborhood and you have a neighborhood book club. And over the last nine months, everyone's been meeting with their book club virtually. But now, half the people in the book club have been vaccinated. So the book club people say, well, you know, I'd really like to have an in-person book club. So let's meet over at Mr. X's house and we're gonna have a book club, but only come if you've been vaccinated. If you haven't been vaccinated, you haven't come. Well, half your people in your book club haven't been vaccinated yet. How do you think they're gonna feel? And how's that work with your social dynamics? And, and that's, that's something about what vaccine equity is about. So right now we're, devout, we're, not, we're not all able to get vaccines. So there are haves and have nots. If you're in a workplace, Oh yeah, you know, you can go to that uh, big sales meeting, you know, in Honolulu that we wanted to do before the pandemic and we've been putting it off, but you can only go if you've been vaccinated. And a third of the people in your workforce haven't been vaccinated yet because their time hasn't come. I mean, that's not fair to them. It's not fair to their career progression. You know, somebody gets an opportunity to do something and another person doesn't. Um, and this kind of gets at the whole vaccine passport issue. You know, you have to have a vaccine passport to do something. That's, um, it's a little hard. So anyway, those are the, those are the three things um, that I think are important when you're making decisions. Um, is one, you're not 100% sure you're gonna, that you are protected. Two, is that you still could possibly be colonized and transmit and three, vaccine equity. So let's take a few examples and we'll run through these. Um, so uh, a loyal viewer asked, Dr. Ola, what would you do if you were an 81 year old female with uh, lung disease and has received two doses of the COVID-19 vaccine and, uh, and now you've waited two weeks since the last shot and, and you've not been you've not been really going out. You've been getting all your groceries delivered or having somebody drop them off at your house. You really haven't been you know, out to the garden center, which was a favorite thing to do. Would you start doing things like that? So this is where the impact on society is pretty minimal because you're not gonna be a high risk to society doing those activities. But your risk of getting COVID yourself is less because you've been vaccinated. And then your risk of getting severe COVID or dying is really low. 
So those things that a lot of us out, you know, who work and have had to continue doing things, doing those things that we've been doing with mass social distancing rather successfully, I might add, um, are going to be a lot more palatable. So if you're 81 and you have lung disease, can okay, now you go and go get your own groceries? Well, your risk of having severe disease has is, is gone down considerably. If you stay masked, if you do the hand hygiene, and you stay distanced, and you do all of those things together, you're going to lower the risk with each one of these, and you get down to an acceptable range. So I would say yes, you can do things like that. You can start doing those things that are a little bit more part of the activities of daily living. Um, and yeah, you can go down to the Greenway and take a walk if it, you may be and have been avoiding that. Um, so, so I think, I think those are things that, um, that uh, make sense. Um, you want to go have and dine outdoors with your spouse and it's outdoors, risk is low. A lot of us have been doing that all right. We've been doing fine with that and we've accepted the risk of doing it, but maybe if you haven't been, now you can. So, um, another question, and this is a real common one for, for our uh, older population. When can I visit my 13 and 15 year old granddaughters in Florida? Their parents have been vaccinated. Okay, so this is a good thing, so you have to think about all the nuances. Parents there have been vaccinated of these kids, but the kids have not. Adolescents pick up COVID at about the same rate as adults, and the rate of having asymptomatic infection is higher. It's also, you're talking Florida. So Florida has got a lot higher penetration of variants, actually. About 35% of all of the B117 variants in the U.S. Uh, have been found in Florida. And so even though you've been vaccinated, um, you know, there, there is a higher chance that you will be exposed to COVID in that household situation from those adolescent kids than say going to the grocery store or dining outside downtown. Um, and so that might be one you're gonna have to think hard about what risk you're willing to accept. Um, and I think a lot of people would say, I'm gonna put it off for a while yet for that spe specific situation. Uh, question, is it safe to get a massage after being fully vaccinated? You know, I think most of us love a pretty good massage. Um, it's a pretty close situation, obviously, and it's usually um, over a, a period of time. Um, if you've been vaccinated and your masseuse has been vaccinated and everyone stays masked, and um, um, your, your risk is going to be fairly low, but you still are going to be within six feet of another person who I assume won't be in your pod or in your household. So um, it would be something to think about about it. If you're you know, 27 years old and you don't have any health problems, um, the risk of you getting severe disease is going to be pretty low, very low. If you're older and have other health problems, you might want to put it off. Um, Susan asks, what about renting a beach house in July with other family members who have also been vaccinated? Uh, and I'm assuming the question is about family members who are outside of your household, because if they're in your own household, it's, it's been fine all along. Um, but if you're doing it and, the, and it's all outside of the household, well, your risk is pretty low. Your risk of, uh, of having a big event spread to the community would be low. Um, if you've all been vaccinated, it brings the risk down considerably. And then if you also mask and try to hang out outdoors at the beach, it's kind of a nice thing to do if the weather's nice, is be outdoors. So hang out on the porch more than hanging out in the great room or in the small room. Um, you know, I think the risk is going to be pretty low and it's okay. The more people you bring into the beach house, the higher the risk goes. So if it was me and my family, I'd probably try to keep it down to a one or two households who've been vaccinated. And I also would keep an eye on how things are going this summer. Um, right now, my prediction is it'll be pretty good, but um, you know, I don't know for sure. 
Sherry asks, what about going out to dinner at a restaurant and someone's home together at the same table for friends who've also been vaccinated? Well, you know, I think if you're dining outdoors and you've been vaccinated, um, then the risk comes down to an acceptable range for a lot of people. Some people still may not want to take the risk um, with dining outdoors because there is, it never goes to zero, there's still going to be some. Doing it indoors, the risk still goes up some, even though you've been vaccinated. Um, and um, again, um, you know, if you invite 12 people over, the risk goes up even more. If you invite only one person over and they've been vaccinated, the risk doesn't go up so high. So you're going to have to make those decisions for yourself um, as to how, you know, how much more risk you want to do. Personally, I am much more comfortable dining outdoors with other people who aren't in my household, and even though I've been vaccinated, and they might be too. And uh, probably will be until our case rates get down even further. Um, Danny will ask, what about hugging my parents who've already um, had both of their shots? Um, well, I'm assuming that you haven't had one, um, and so, um, you know, that kind of close contact, um, you know, raises, raises the risks um, for somebody, assuming the parents are much older. Um, and if you've been transiently colonized, um, there's a chance you could transmit it to them. Um, so um, I think, you know, that's a tough one because the close intimacy of a hug with your own family is something that we would all like to do. But um, it might be something, at least for a while, um, until we know a little bit more about ultimate protection for the vaccines and how long that protection lasts, that I might still avoid that. Um, but I think visiting them might be fine. But uh, hugging, hugging it just raises the risk. <clears throat> Take my 93-year-old mama for a haircut in a salon that is following safety guidelines. If mama's been, assuming mama's been vaccinated, um, well, um, hair salons. If as long as everyone is following the safety guidelines and the, and the vaccine has been and the, the mother's been successfully vaccinated, the, the risk comes down considerably, but it's still not zero. Um, and 93 is um, in a range that in the unvaccinated group, um, the mortality risk from COVID is very high. It's above 20%. Um, so even though the vaccine's going to bring that down um, considerably, um, it might be something that um, um, you want to put off um, rather than going to a hair salon for them. Return to in-person worship at a church that does not require masks in the sanctuary. So this, this, that's, a, that's a good question because in a church situation, first of all, church transmissions and super spreader events have not been uncommon. Um, so we've run into those throughout COVID. If the, if the safety guidelines are followed in a church and the masks um, are required and are worn, the, the risk comes down considerably, but it's still, it's not zero. Um, and so if you're going, going into a situation like that where everyone's unmasked, basically you're relying only on one protection, um, and that's the protection of your vaccine. And personally, that would be a risk that would be hard for me to accept. Now, if you start adding on protections, everyone's distanced, everyone's masked, and that church has not had any problems with other events because uh, so you know that things are working and you're vaccinated then now you have four or five protections and, and those all work together in that situation it might be acceptable <clears throat> um, Vicki wants to know how about having my grandchildren spend the night with me on vacation with them this summer um, well, the kids, the kids are the, still going to be unvaccinated for a while. Um, the trials are just starting in children from the ages of 12 to 18. The UK is doing it from 6 to 12. Um, and so the kids aren't going to probably be vaccinated until at least late summer. 
um, so kids will be able to pick it up um, and um, and so you could be exposed in that situation um, so if it's in summer or late summer assuming you're vaccinated now um, then that means you're with you're out more than three months from being vaccinated because it's summertime and um, and we don't really know yet um, how long the immunity from the vaccine is going to persist. Looks like six months is still going to be good, but we don't know 100% for sure. So I'm not sure I'd be making a lot of strong plans right now to do that. As summertime comes around and we got more data, we got more information, we've got more experience, then it might be easier to, to add it on then once we know that than it would be to start making those plans now. So in other words, don't buy the plane tickets right now. But if you got a shot at it in July and the information then looks good, it might, we, might, we might relax on that one. Tracy uh, uh, asks, how about how hosting a ladies' luncheon with my 81-year-old mother and a small group of her friends for her birthday? Everyone would have had both shots. The luncheon would be held in a large barn with good ventilation. Her birthday was a couple of weeks ago, so how soon could we safely do that? Well, you're in a large barn. It's ventilated. People wear masks. Small number of people. You get together. It's probably okay. Um, now, if you change some of those parameters and have it in a small cottage behind your house, then the risk goes up because it's a small, poorly ventilated area. So again, the principle here is you add as many protective functions in as you can and the safer it all becomes for everybody. And eventually that safety will hit a point where you're acceptable with the risk. Um, Patricia asks, what about going to a family outdoor cookout even though 13 of the 16 family members have not been vaccinated? <clears throat> Well, it depends, um, it, assuming you've been vaccinated um, and it really is outdoors and if everyone is doing the social distancing and it's 16 people, so it would come under the governor, knew he could do it, he says 25 right now for outdoors. And if everyone follows the rules, um, the risk is gonna be pretty low. You might be able to get away with that. I mean, think about it. Last fall, we were having an outdoor cookouts with 10 to 15 people, masked and socially distanced, um, and um, and it was a pretty low risk event then. So that hasn't changed. Um, but um, um, so um, that one might be good. The, the the devil here is in the detail of following the plan. So if it gets cooler in the evening and people start going in the house to go to the bathroom or pick out a drink or something and then they stay in the house rather than coming back outdoors, now you have an indoor situation rather than an outdoor and the risk goes up. So make the plan, stay outside, and stick with it. Uh, Edith asks, travel to the beach, stay at a hotel, and eat out at restaurants. My husband and I both have had both doses. Um, <coughs> Again, while we were talking about um, if you're dining outdoors, you know, just the dining event's okay. Um, if you're staying at a hotel and you're staying distanced and, um, and not uh, hanging out with large groups of people in the lobby or going to a crowded restaurant off the lobby or staying in the bar um, in the evening, um, you know, it's probably okay. But the longer you do that and the, and the, and the more events that you have while you do it, um, then um, the, the higher the risk is going to go. Um, so, um, so anyway, that's a, a shot at some of the questions. Hopefully that kind of gives people some examples um, of, of what, how you can relax a little bit. But I think, I think the overall arching principle is that if you're gonna, when you're gonna, thinking about doing something, think about it hard and add up as many protections to yourself and to the people around you as you can. And, um, and the more you have, um, the better it'll be. So I think the best situation are those people who've been avoiding life totally 
and have been st stuck in the house and not interacting at all, you, and you've had two shots, you can start to loosen up and do things that the rest of us have been doing with masks and distancing all along fairly safely. And, um, and um, so that, that one, I think, is something that's going to be really helpful to people. Otherwise, when you're starting to think about some of these other situations, you're going to have to decide what level of risk for yourself you're willing to take, how many protections can you take, um, did it make sense that you may have thought about doing it before being vaccinated anyway? Now that you're vaccinated, maybe it'll tip you over to being able to do it. But um, So a lot of these are going to be personal decisions based on your level of risk you're going to accept. Some people don't like risk at all, wouldn't think of uh, walking out of their house without a million dollars of life insurance. Other people bungee jump. So it's a little bit of a spectrum. Um, oh, I was also going to add on, I'll tack it on to the end. Um, uh, yesterday it was announced that here in Forsyth County, uh, a person had been identified who had, had been infected with the B117 variant, which is uh, the UK variant um, that's got a little bit higher risk of uh, transmission um, than the wild type virus. Um, does this surprise me? No. Um, even if this person wouldn't be here, I would just assume there's still so, some of this around. Um, overall now, probably about 5% of our population on the state of, uh, of, of positive COVID patients have the variant. Most, the, well, about half of our counties in North Carolina have identified at least one person. Most states in our country have identified a couple people. So um, this variant is going to end up being the predominant variant um, in our region, um, probably within a couple months. Uh, the question is, is what is that going to mean? It might slow down the case decline by a little bit, um, but um, you know, I, the, the things that we are already doing to prevent transmission, masks and um, distancing and hand hygiene work against the variant also. And so uh, um, if we keep doing those things, the vaccine also seems to work pretty well against it. All of, all of the vaccines that we will have next week. So, all right, so I guess I'll open it up to questions um, now. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, so the, the COVID long haulers um, is not a very well, <clears throat> first of all, we don't have a very well defined case definition for what a long hauler is. Um, some people report prolonged fatigue. Um, that seems to be the most common symptom. Um, prolonged um, fogginess of thought and, and um, they, they describe like, they feel like they're walking around in a cloud. Things just aren't sharp to them. Um, a few of them will have a chronic cough um, that comes and goes. Some say they have feverishness that comes and goes, although that's not as well documented. So really when you put all of these things together, um, it, it kind of resembles what we've called um, chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, over the ages, um, and um, and it, it's not and the, those types of post illness events have never been very well understood yet, um, and it, you know it's not just in a person's head; they really feel that way. And um, but it but in it's, it's not just with COVID. I mean, these type of uh, um, post illness syndromes have existed. Um, for decades, probably centuries, actually, um, and um, and the fact they're just not that well understood. They're not. Um, it's a little bit hard to know how best to, to manage them and treat them. But it a lot of it comes down to taking care of the um, of the individual as a whole, an overall wellness approach um, to. To the to the syndrome, there, I don't think there's going to be a magic drug 
the virus in these people is gone, uh, so it's not persistent infection. Um, and um, but um, but unfortunately, you know, modern Western medicine has never been very good with syndromes that are mostly symptoms where you can't do a scan and see something there where you can't find, you know. Um, so we'll have to see. Hopefully there's a lot of research put into this because it'll benefit society forever. Because like I said, when 40 years when something, another infection comes through a population, even a different kind of flu for instance, if we understand COVID long haul, it'll help us understand how to approach those too. Well, you know, I don't think we, we know exactly for sure what the prevalence of long haul is in people and what the prevalence would be based on all those symptoms. But the ones you described, the fogginess, the memory, the migraine headaches, the general just feeling of ill-being um, is kind of what defines it. Um, those, are, those are common symptoms. They were common symptoms for chronic fatigue syndrome as well. I mean, I've seen, being an infectious disease doctor now for almost 30 years, I've seen a lot of people refer to me who've had an illness describe, oh, I had periflu, or I had adenovirus, or, or I had a virus, I didn't, no one knew what it was, and now I feel this way. And um, so the, the syndrome's really not new. Um, it's, and it's not, it's not limited just to COVID patients. And then, I guess, just shifting gears, one question. Uh, Moderna announced a trial for a new vaccine or a tweak to their vaccine to treat the variants, um, specifically in South Africa. How important is it to have a trial and look at making tweaks to that vaccine? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, tweaking vaccines um, for variants. Well, this is something that um, we've been doing um, for, for influenza for ages, um, since the 60s. <laughs> and because and we know influenza shifts, so every year we tweak the vaccine trying to catch up to what those shifts are. Um, and so um, whenever you have uh, an RNA virus that has the potential to move around um, and create its own variants, you might have to shift the vaccine as well to try to keep up and catch up with it. So it's an important thing to do. And it also gets at the question is, is are we going to have to take um, a, uh, a COVID vaccine every year like we do for flu? Um, I don't think anyone knows for sure, but I'm, the more and more I dedox I talk to now about it, I think we're, we kind of think we might be doing that, yeah. And maybe it won't be every year, maybe it'll ever be every three or four years we need to get boosted. And there are other vaccines we boost too, right? Tetanus and um, whooping cough and, and so we, it's part of what we do. But yeah, COVID might be part of that as well. And we would be using the tweaked vaccines. Um, and when you said a trial, Moderna doing a trial, actually the FDA basically came out and said that if you're doing minor tweaks of a vaccine, you don't have to do a full clinical trial. Um, and you can um, vaccinate smaller numbers of people and measure their responses. Because the safety aspects really won't be any difference because you're just changing the messenger and RNA by a, a tweak so that the antibody that it produces is a little bit more directed. And uh, so that's good because that means we'll be able to get those out faster. Um, you just you vaccinate some people and then you look and see what kind of antibodies they make. And if those antibiotics are, are neutralizing to the variant virus you're studying, bingo, you got it and you can put it into production. Yeah, so what do I tell the people in groups four or five other than please be patient? Um, <laughs> uh, 
Um, well, first of all, is, uh, is don't despair. Um, the fact that your group hasn't come up yet doesn't mean that people haven't forgotten about you. And we do have your back. We will get you. Don't worry, we will not forget. Um, <laughs> we won't just kind of let it, let it go. Y you will get a chance. And it's really not as far off as you think, because right now, I mean, we're moving into March. And, um, and Fauci and others, including and myself, um, looking at vaccine production and where we're headed, I think by mid-July, most everyone who's wanted a vaccine will have been able to get one. Oh, yeah. Except for the kids, yeah. Okay, so yeah. my next question then. So anyone who wants it, what's your time on So everyone by summer? Yes, by summer. So here's how I would think it's going to roll out. And, you know, it may adjust a little bit here and there, but so we'll, we'll, we're going to start doing all our frontline people um, next. So in March, that really opens up. By getting into April, vaccine supply is going to be increased enough, and our distribution and vaccine centers will have been ramped up enough that we'll probably be looking at opening it up to people with underlying illnesses who are under the age of 65 next, sometime maybe in April. Um, and then we'll get through a bunch of them, and then probably sometime in May, um, it'll be open up to anyone all ages who want to get it, except for under 18, because those clinical trials to get the FDA approval for kids won't have been completed yet. So college kids, sometime in June maybe, um, and uh, which is a big thing for getting back to school in fall for them. And um, but yeah, I think I think by July, um, you know, it'll be. Everyone will have a hunting license, and there'll be a lot more deer to go get. So. Um, I have a question. So, when it comes to adding another group to this vaccine list, you were talking about this earlier. Now, educators and everyone in that education system are eligible. People who are 65 and older were already struggling to get their appointments. What is your message to them? Yeah, so yeah, for those 65 years and older um, who maybe your appoint, you have an appointment, but it's in May right now or something like that. Um, yeah, so with it, we're, we're going to still keep working hard on the 65 or older group. Um, we're not going to let one group of people replace the others. Um, so they'll still be eligible and we'll still be encouraged to get vaccinated and, um, and we'll still have slots. What the thing is, is that, you know, as supply goes up, and again, I'm, I'm really optimistic that by, by the end of March, it'll get really better. By the end of April, um, quite, quite more will be available. So, um, so a lot of people who have their appointments in May will already have been, they'll, they'll get moved up. And I know, like with the health department, that uh, we've already started doing that. As, as more vaccine becomes available, we, take those people. So if your appointment is in May, you will get moved up by almost all health systems. We're not going to just leave you out in May and take somebody else first. We move those people up first. So if you've been waiting in line for a while, you know, it'll pay off. So you mentioned those um, variants, um, but it sounds like so we had such a backlog in these um, vaccines. How do you know for sure that there is going to be a faster demand? Like, of course, as you said, I mean, you're already telling me by like early summer that you know almost everyone in the final groups will be vaccinated. So will we be able to keep up with this demand? Midsummer, midsummer. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, we'd be able to keep up. Um, I think so. Yeah, I think we can. So um, you know, the we the the thing is, is that for the current variants that we have out there now. Um, the three vaccines, JJ's, Moderna, and Pfizer's, all do a pretty good job. Um, for preventing deaths, they do in those, with those variants, they do a very good job. Preventing hospitalizations, good job. Um, they may not prevent mild infection quite as well, but, um, but they, they, they do it good enough so that, um, that just because we don't have the tweak vaccine ready yet, well, uh, it's, uh, I think we'll be okay. Yeah. You don't think the variants would impact the process, the timeline as of now? 
I don't, I don't think so. You know, with the caveat that I, I'm not a future predictor and you don't know what next thing might come down the pike. One thing that's encouraging about the variant, see the more transmission that's going on, the more likelihood that a variant might vary even more, right? And the more little tiny mutations you add on, the further away it gets from the wild type virus, which, we've had, which, we're, which our immunity has been designed for. So the fact that our numbers have come down and our transmission has come down in this country you know, to a, a much more comfortable, we're not out of the woods, but a much more comfortable um, number um, that the odds of a variant popping up are going to be less. And so, but the thing is, is in order for us to keep that number down, particularly right now when only 13% um, of the entire population of the United States has gotten their first dose of vaccine, we're still going to need to be doing what we have been doing for the last nine months uh, to prevent virus transmission. It is so important to keep doing that, uh, particularly right now. And what do you have to say in response to um, Governor Cooper yesterday announcing, you know, easing those restrictions that will allow more people to gather? Would like to say we are on this good trend. Would, is that, could that possibly mess that up? Yeah, so with uh, relaxing some of the restrictions we've had, could it mess it up? Well, it could. Um, it, it all depends on pe how people follow the spirit of it. So and it's kind of like what we've been talking about. So you can, 50 people outdoors, but if 50 people are outdoors in um, distanced wearing masks, maybe it'll be okay. Um, if 25 people are indoor and everyone's wearing a mask and it's in a well-ventilated place and it's not in some hole-in-the-wall bar down in wherever, <laughs> um, you know, then um, it might be, it's probably okay. But if you start cramming a bunch of people in a small unventilated place, even if masked, it might be risky. The other thing that we, we, and I've been saying this all along, taking a little bit of heat for it, but the MMWR came out this week. Fitness centers are still a big deal. They're a problem. Because a lot of people, when they go in the fitness center and they really get into the, the aerobic exercise, they take their mask off. A lot of these places aren't well ventilated. And the fitness machines and such keep the virus airborne. And so the six foot distance doesn't mean so much anymore. You can go further. And so, you know, as the weather gets nicer, I really would like to encourage people to do their aerobic fitness outdoors. Um, and for the fitness centers, I know some of the spin classes and stuff, take them outdoors. That's fine, that's cool. But particularly if you're in a smaller, not so well ventilated area, um, it's still gonna be a transmission problem. And even if you're vaccinated, I wouldn't go in one my, personally. I wouldn't do it. Yeah, so the internet thing is is that, um, so like with our geriatric centers, our stick center, for example, um, is, is having actually personal outreach and helping people make those appointments who don't have an internet. So phone call, basically you make the appointment for them. And then um, for people who are homebound, um, going to the home and doing the vaccination there. Um, it's not the most efficient for vaccinating large groups of people, but boy, it's, you know, it's the right thing to do so that everyone can, gets a shot at getting vaccinated. Um, and uh, the county is working with, um, you know, trying to get uh, transportation, because um, like right now for the county site, I mean, you kind of have to park and walk in. For some people that's hard, so making sure the wheelchair, other modes of short-term transportation are available to get them in um, and, and to help with that. Um, we're doing vaccines now in dialysis centers, um, and so that the people who are on dialysis, makes sense, right? They're there for three hours, great time to vaccinate them. Um, and so we're taking the vaccine to those centers and doing them there. Um, we're trying to do more outreach. Um, we're gonna be setting up our mobile vaccination unit to take, to take them into the neighborhoods where people can congregate, going to the places of faith where people can get to because they're used to doing that. 
So a lot of it's just, you know, using some ingenuity and trying to figure out things and just realizing, yeah, it's a little bit of, you know, takes a little bit of time and energy, but it's worth it. Yay!